Department of English and Cultural Studies at Christ University. She has written many articles in periodicals and journals, published many research articles and in reputed journal, and has been an esteemed guide for the PhD students, and is known for creative ways in her classes and co-curricular activities she organizes for her classroom. She has been invited as a moderator, keynote speaker, and presenter at various seminars and conferences. On a more personal note, she has been a member of the English Department of Jyotinavas College. Welcome back, ma'am. Ma'am, please accept a token of love from us. Now, let's begin with the very first event of the academic year 2023, organized by the English Department and the Lit Club of Jyotinavas Autonomous College, the National Public Lecture Series 1, which is on sound, text and spatiality, song as audiotopia and oral narratives with our inspiring speaker, Dr. Shobana P. Matthews. Now, I welcome our dear speaker, Dr. Shobana P. Matthews to take over. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so please uh, feel free, uh, first of all, to interrupt me as and when, but uh, your lights are blinding. So if I can't see, uh, someone just yell out and say, ma'am, we have a question. Uh, largely because this area is, uh, I'm told, I mean, I don't assume that uh, I have done anything very novel or unique, but I do know that this is less uh, charted territory for a lot of us in, in the academia and in academia. And so therefore, if there is anything which at any point doesn't sit well with you or you're not quite sure, please uh, interrupt me. I'm most open to uh, taking questions on the spot. Don't wait for the end of the session because that's when we all want to go home, especially when there's a white topping thing happening outside. So yeah, I know I had to jump across concrete and things and I was a little panicky. I thought Monday morning when you come back or next week, you'll find me stuck in your concrete there. So uh, with that, shows you, tells you some things about myself. Um, let me begin with, uh, is there any way that I can get this light out? Uh, just wanted to ask, how many of you listen to rock and roll? Honest answer. <laughs> to rock and roll, Western, Western popular music? Not many of you. I can't see the hands because of the lights, I think. Anyway, uh, I'm assuming that quite a few of you do, or at least have heard your parents listening to. In my classes, I offer a paper right now at Christ University called the... No, <laughs> total darkness. Uh, called the Politics, uh, Poetics and the Pivotal People of Rock and Roll. Now, you might ask what politics and what poetics and what uh, pivotal people, uh, well, that takes an entire course to answer that question. So today, what I'm going to do for you, because I understand you also have master's students here who are involved in research. What I'm going to do is quickly take you through how I came across this, uh, why I chose this topic for research. Now, when I was growing up uh, many years ago in university, like all of you, uh, I didn't have the luxury um, of a lot of the devices that we have today. And um, I also do come from, I must acknowledge my privilege, I came from a family which was already steeped in theater, music, uh, you know, um, literature and all of this. So there was a lot of familiarity with texts. I had grown up reading uh, very inappropriately at very young ages, read writers like D.H. Lawrence. I think today we don't respect these writers as much as I wish we did. But I had discovered literature when I was really young. You could call me precocious. So by the time I reached university, I developed a very hearty, healthy dislike for the written word. And you might ask how am I heading the Department of English and Culture Studies now? Uh, I realized that today when we say reading, we're assuming that everybody reads printed texts. 
right? And the book becomes everything. Yes, it is. The book was for a very long time, everything for us, but it wasn't always like that. Uh, what I did or what I have researched, which is as you can see here, sound, space, textuality, these all sound like very uh, intimidating, fancy terms. But when I break it down for you, it's so exciting to see that things around us are worthy of literary study, not any study, but literary study. And uh, as I was saying, uh, for me, if you uh, have you all read or have you had to read at some point uh, Homer's Iliad? Yes, no, you had to at some point in your life read uh, the Iliad, excerpts from the Iliad. Uh, Homer himself was a musician, right? He sang in, he recited in modes, in what we call today lyrical modes, which were meant for performance. They were never meant to be read through textbooks and things. And uh, I don't know, I'm not familiar with what the kind of textbooks you use, but sometimes when I look at the textbooks that we are forced to use in academia, so, some of them rob the written word of its beauty, right? Of its performativity. Let me be more academic about it. So when I say performativity, what do I mean? Every single word that we use is like a coin. You know, you all had uh, coins uh, in your little money boxes at home. And you know that over the years, some of them are lying there in those boxes and we never look at them. Some we take out, you know, desperately when you need to travel on the metro or somewhere. I, I don't know who uses coins today, but yes, we do need them. That's also quite a privileged statement to make. There are a lot of people using these coins. It's the same thing with words. You know, you use them, they 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 are in currency, they're in circulation, and that's how it works. But where were these words? Do were they always stored in textbooks and books? Not really, because the origin of all literature began with oral cultures, with oral traditions, with song. Before, you know, you all have heard, uh, I'm sure my friends in the colleague in the department would have heard Abba saying, um, I was a dancer before I could walk and I was a singer before I could speak. Uh, that's true of all of us. Every one of us has uh, hummed, haven't you all, as babies? Did you all wake up? I mean, did you, were you all born saying to be or not to be? I'm pretty sure no. I'm sure you uh, you remember. I mean, I do. You may not remember because that would be quite strange. But I'm pretty sure you've seen little babies and you see how they babble and there's so much joy. So these are all the qualities of music: the ability to make a sound, to produce a sound for a certain emotion and such like, right? And as we mature, we, as Wordsworth says, shades of the prison house draw about us and we lose these abilities. So really, what I did uh, very often when I'm introduced at conferences and things as uh, your uh, secretary, very your literary secretary, very kindly introduced me. Uh, yes, I have been interviewed, 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 and introduced many times. But it's quite fascinating because everyone says I've been doing something new. I don't think so. I think I've regressed a lot. I've taken literature back to its origins rather than take it forward. And I believe that is what a lot of musicians do. You know, take literature right back to its origins. So. Uh, before I begin, a couple of terms that I want you to see, and then I'm going to play you two tracks, which is why I have my noisy phone with me to make sure that I don't overshoot uh, time. So uh, I'm going to play you two tracks, one which will, I hope, make you see what my thesis was all about, my doctoral thesis. Research was, I did my uh, MPhil way before all of you were born, <laughs> and uh, it was on, uh, have you all heard of Bob Dylan? Master students, uh, Rupa ma'am just told me that you have Bob Dylan on your syllabus. I'm so proud of you. Uh, that's the way to go forward. Uh, we also have papers in popular culture and music. However, I don't uh, look at Bob Dylan as a popular musician, but rather almost classical in his uh, compositions. I'll come to all of this. So I did my MPhil way back in the 90s. I can't even remember. Uh, on Dylan. And uh, it's very interesting because when Dylan won the Nobel in 2016, uh, there was chaos, you know, there was this, the world was split in two. It was almost like the whole uh, debate about are you a fan of um, LOTR or Harry Potter? Are you, a, you know, um, what's that Game of Thrones fan or a Mad Men fan? It became like a caste system in the world. You know, should we allow musicians to win Nobel Prizes? Of course, the happiest person in the universe was me. 
because somewhere I felt validated that all the sleepless nights reading, researching, writing had come to some, uh, you know, he won the Nobel, not me, but it felt like I had. So uh, please excuse me my uh, eccentricities. So the first thing that we need to, of course, these are some very simple terms, which I'm sure you, if you look at the screen, I'm keeping my screen here, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, one of the things is we look at oral cultures and we assume that that everything is encapsulated in that word. Not at all, because oral C is the ability to speak and it is voice centered, right? So if you turn around and say hi to the person sitting next to you, that's an oral mode of communication. Uh, I was introduced uh, very, uh, you know, fluently without any papers and things. Orally, she said all these things about me and I'm responding, right? But all of you sitting here are listening. I hope. Can I have a show of hands as to who is listening? <laughs> right. So, okay, fine. This will make sure you don't fall asleep. Uh, anyway, so for me, the interesting part was this. You know, I was listening to a lady talking, a uh, researcher. She spoke to us at Christ for some uh, refresher course or one of these things. And uh, at that uh, forum, she mentioned that she had done a lot of uh, work with, I mean, she's a scholar in the in oral traditions and documentation of oral literatures. So she had done a project in MG Road, documenting the stories of businessmen on MG Road. So uh, the minute she said it's a sound uh, production, I was very excited as that at that time, I'd still not uh, decided on my PhD topic. I knew that I didn't want to do anything which anyone I knew had done. I'm a little arrogant like that. I wanted to do something which I could, you know, be, uh, you know, own, which could be mine. And so that's how I was. And at that point, I heard this lady talking about oral cultures, and she was talking about listening to interviews. And then she played us these interviews with businessmen, and everybody else, like the good people that they were, were listening to what the businessmen were saying. I I opened my shop, Lakeview Ice Cream, you all know that, uh, in MG Road, in the year, so-and-so, and all of that. Me, being a bit of a, a pain, was not listening to what he was saying. I was listening to all the ambient sounds, because I could hear crows. And every time his door opened and shut, I could hear the MG Road traffic. I could hear... Uh, you know, maybe this was ice cream parlor and all that. So I could hear the waiters speaking in Kannada and Tamil, Hindi, all of this. So the minute the session ended, I raised my hand and asked her, I said, so uh, what were you trying to do by recording all of that? You know, the sound, the ambient sounds. And she said, well, nothing. That was just an accident. You were supposed to be listening to the interview. So, I mean, the rest of the audience understood what the interview was. I was not listening at all to the words. Because for me, there was a wealth of knowledge in the sound surrounding uh, the, the voice, right? Uh, consider this. If, for instance, and this is how a lot of my students get themselves into trouble, you send me a voice note saying, uh, can't submit my assignment because I'm down with viral fever, dengue, and all these things. And then I can hear very clearly nice, uh, you know, jazz lounge music in the background. Uh, what am I supposed to think? <laughs> right? At this point, you know, this is where I become a bit of a detective. So I have this uh, understanding with my students, please be honest. Uh, I'll try not to lose it with you. But don't do these things because sound is has its own meaning, you know, significance. For instance, uh, pitch tonality, the pitch of my voice. Uh, I do know that I have a lower pitched voice than a lot of the, you know, dulcet tones of a lot of the ladies here. I have a more uh, low voice, which comes from years of yelling at people and <laughs> being quite loud, uh, all of this. So voice and sound are two different things altogether. This took, I had to have get into lots of arguments with people who came and told me, why aren't you using linguistic theories? And my argument was, this is not a sound, this is not a voice piece of research. I am researching sound, not voice. What's the difference? Sound is everything. For instance, if I shut up for a second now, we will assume that we experience silence. But let me tell you, silence is a myth. There is no silence at all in the world. Because when I took that break for a second, as I did again, if you were mindful, you would have heard, I think it's your air conditioners, and um, I'm pretty sure I've heard people yawning somewhere in the distance and uh, you, a whole lot of things. 
and if i requested your uh, auditorium in charge people here to turn the ac off no i'm not going to do that turn off the ac turn off the lights turn off the fans whatever it is uh, we'll sit in absolute silence and you think we'd still have silence no because then we'd hear us breathing and you know uh, those of you who share rooms with siblings and family you know one person's deep breathing can keep us up all night and it's quite irritating but uh, breath even the quietest breath is making a vibration around us what if i distributed clothes pins to everybody and said block your noses no breathing you know everybody sit here quietly no breathing for 10 seconds 15 seconds do you know what would happen anyone Want to take a guess? Yes, that's a great. I don't know. I can't see. Like I said, you know, I'll have to wave and okay, Rith. Okay, get got you. Uh, so yes, heartbeats. Heartbeats, obviously, because if you've got a really bad fright when you're alone at home, you know, you can hear the blood coursing through your veins. You can hear your heartbeat. All of this. Listen, hold on to that because I'm going to be talking about that when I play you the song. What about uh, if? No, I'm not going to ask you to stop. Ask your heart to stop beating, but. if we sat in that absolute silence with our hearts beating pounding in our ears what else would we hear and i'm talking about a prolonged experiment with soundproofing rooms there are uh, experiments done like this and i think the i can't remember ex uh, exact numbers but i think 45 minutes was the maximum time that people could sit in an an echoic chamber that is a chamber which is fully padded off there's no sound from outside and you're sitting there after that you start losing your sanity the reason is uh, you can't believe this but we, the reason we are thinking and sentient beings able to perform in a certain way socially is because we are able to also pick up sound cues now there's a whole different world uh, i'm sure you will have questions for me as to what about people who can't hear uh, we'll come to that you know because there's another way you've all heard the story of helen keller yes yeah Yes, so you know that vibrations are a mode of actually picking up sound and other qualities. Anyway, uh, what I was going to tell you is, if we actually were immersed in an an echoic chamber, we would start hearing, and believe believe me, this is scary. We would start hearing our blood rushing through our veins, and if we were there a little longer, we would also be able to hear our internal organs. You know, and that is really frightening because. most of us believe that within our bodies is a very quiet silent uh, neat place which you only see dissected uh, in textbooks like in you know, bi biology textbooks which mercifully most of us in the humanities don't have to look at but we imagine but uh, there are experiments done people like john cage who have studied this and it is it has been proved beyond doubt that the inside of the human body is one of the most noisy spaces it's like a factory there you know every um, you know when it's sometimes when you drink a lot of water you can hear the water going down your throat and uh, this is really living in a very micro thing but uh, micro level but it's quite fascinating because there's another level of reality that we don't seem to be aware of now those of us who meditate and i'm sure there are plenty here perhaps when you're as you get older like i do you want to uh, like i am now you know you want to be left alone and you want to listen to your thoughts we've said this i can't hear my thoughts it's so noisy uh, a lot of this is metaphoric and a lot of it comes from the truth okay so this is about orality oralcy and orality orality is the way the aesthetics of listening right how we listen so uh, for instance if i walked into a particularly uh, tough classroom where everyone's giving me a really bad time and sometimes we do have those kind of classes where everybody is restless and i'm sure you don't know those kind of things but where i teach sometimes people nobody wants to it have a class in the afternoon this is the uh, kind of taboo hour for everybody too in the afternoon post lunch everyone is just thinking of uh, other things they could be doing and at this point you know and you're trying to get everybody to listen to you one of the things you realize is how do we listen right i can be very i walk into class and say it's a privilege to be here at 2 o'clock in the afternoon you know you're looking at my facial cues you're saying nothing about your face tells us that you're happy to be here at 2 in the afternoon so voice as uh, sound and voice are embodied and all the linguists will understand what i'm saying and agree with what i'm saying but let's go back to what i was talking about which is sound and music uh you've all heard the very famous uh, 
you know, piece, film, sound of music and all of this. So I'm not going to talk about how important. Let me tell you what I began researching for my PhD. I knew I wanted to work with music and literature because I believe from Homer, even up to some of the early British writers, we are talking about the Anglo-Saxon writers, they wrote hymns for performance. They sang their hymns. In fact, I uh, can't remember, C Cadman's hymn, uh, he woke up having seen, heard a hymn in his sleep and then he became this very famous, I mean, he wrote, he was a scop who wrote these songs and uh, it was accepted in the, you know, as the canons of literature, the early canon. Anyway, uh, I digress. I wanted to tell you that I'm not sure if any of you here are familiar, apart from some of the faculty who are interested, if any of you are familiar with this musician that's who is on the screen right now, uh, ma'am, I've gone on to slide number, what is it, uh, seven, because I just skipped out all the definitions. I, I don't want to waste time on that. Uh, slide number seven. Okay. Uh, the man you see here, is anybody familiar with him? Mark Knopfler? No. A oh, few people, yes, wow. <laughs> yeah, I can see you now. So uh, I, I'm i guessing your parents, a uh, lot of them may have heard Knopfler. I began with Bob Dylan, who's a country a folk uh, artist, folk rock artist, and uh, my thesis is available if anybody wants to read it. I made a case for the fact that his writing has the ability to, as we saw, it's more, um, mainly sociological kind of study, how protest was a folk rock uh, area. because. See, it's very interesting, you know, I and mean, sometimes I'm worried about talking about these things in public. See, for instance, when you say music, we still, I identify with the musicians, though I'm not a musician myself, with the world of musicians, music has not been censored the way other writing has been censored, right? So you will notice whenever there's a, a, a protest or something, you will find people singing. You will find people chanting, and a chant is a very rudimentary form of a song, right? So protests and songs have been, you know, gone together for the longest time, and that's for another day, so I'm not going in there. That's what I studied way back in the 90s, soon after my stint at Jyoti Navas, when I taught here many years ago. Uh, moving on, when I came back to, uh, got back to academia and I was teaching in classes, I realized that this world of sound has gone dead. Not because sound doesn't exist. It's because we academics uh, are sitting on our high horses. I don't mean anybody here. So uh, apologies. Uh, but the general world of academia has a lot of snobbishness, especially literary academia. We're very particular that we study the canonical writing or writers with a certain quality. But nobody wants to define what that quality is. Of course, I told you I'm a little headstrong that way. I decided I would go into this area and look at what makes for literature. Right. If I can prove that this song is literary, then I've got another instead of prescribing over and over and over the same, you know, bunch of texts, even though we keep bringing in more and more uh, new new writers and everything. Why not open up a new domain altogether for listening and, uh, ex you know, responding to literary texts so that the onus was on me to prove that literature exists in sound. This is what my thesis was all about orality. Now, Mark Knopfler, uh, when I first heard him, I was in my teens, not teens, actually, I was doing my master's, so a little older than that. And I was in college in Chennai, and Chennai has a very rich music tradition, especially Western rock and roll. Some of the greatest bands in the 80s and 90s came from Chennai. Chennai, Calcutta, Bangalore, these are the places. That's why I use that word in my presentation, audiotopia, right? A uh, little side uh, anecdote here. My son, who's an artist, recently was interviewed for an award in in uh, New Delhi by an art collective in Delhi, you know, for some, um, I forget, he's doing so many things. What is it called? A uh, residency. So when they interviewed him, they asked him about his work, of course, and he answered all those questions. Then somebody on the panel suddenly asked him, so what kind of music do you listen to? You know, and uh, he's around a little older than all of you. So he immediately launched into a playlist of the 1970s, 1980s bands. And the panel looked at him for a long time. This was online. And they said, you're a typical Bangalore boy, you know. And uh, he uh, is a very quiet person. So he wasn't very, uh, you know, he just came and told me, he said, they said this about me that I don't think I'm going to win because they said, you're a typical Bangalore boy. Like it's a bad thing. And well, later he won. But uh, what was really fascinating was, I was very curious, what is this Bangalore identity which depends on music? 
And I found my answer in this term, which is used by some Mexican sociologists, that spaces become audiotopias. They are rich with space, right? So every space, just like every person has signature ways of dressing, ways of speaking and everything, every place has a sound pattern, a design, which we are not always listening to. So that was fascinating for me. Imagine if you were given recorders and sent out to map a sound map uh, of, let's say, this area, Koramangla, this particular area. Uh, is it distinct from, say, our neighborhood, which is just across the road? Uh, what would be the difference? One of the things we'd notice is linguistic uh, differences. Then the kind of language that we use, you know, all of this. And more than all of that, traffic sounds, uh, music, which is popular, that said, may not be so popular here. Or what you listen to, maybe we don't know about there. Those kind of things will emerge and a soundscape will emerge from this. And that is what we would refer to in terms of academics as audiotopias. So audiotopias are fascinating things because, see, at one level, it sounds very casual. You know, audiotopia is music that they listen to. So if I go to Shivaji Nagar, I will hear this kind of music. If I come to Al Sur, I will hear this very strong Tamil because, you know, we know that it's like almost like a ghetto. People from certain regions live in certain areas. However, it becomes a problem, audiotopias, when it comes this paper that I was reading about the border, Mexico-USA border language, sounds, you know, the kind of food that is being cooked or prepared, the kind of uh, music that is being heard will define more quantitatively what a border is than actually drawing a line. And I'm not going to into that. And you can do the math. Uh, imagine if we started looking for audiotopias when it came to the subcontinent, when it came to different places. You know, what is there a huge difference between some of our states if we looked at sound qualities and not at people and not at money and not at our possessions, you know? So anyway, um, I, I'd i like to play you this song and um, I want you all to listen very carefully. So let me briefly tell you about Mark Knopfler. Knopfler was the front man of this band called Dire Straits from the 1980s, very popular in the 1980s. I'm sure when you go home today and talk about it, if at all you remember and you mentioned uh, Dire Straits to your parents, there's someone in around the dining table who's going to say, yes, I grew up uh, listening to Dire Straits. Um, and interestingly about Dire Straits is they were a British band. Most of, uh, are some of the best bands in the world, including uh, Dire Straits and the next band that I'm going, I hope I'll have time to play for you, Pink Floyd, are all British origin bands, right? Traveled across the world. Why do we take them seriously and why do we study them in our literature, uh, sociology classes, our culture, political classes particularly? Because they have things to say which have not been studied by people like us. And that is why they are peace, they're at peace because their words have not been censored. And therefore, they appeal to people on the streets. They appeal to people who need them and who can actually create these audiotopias, right? become worlds for us. Uh, uh, Mark Knopfler has this one song in his early days called Private Investigation. I'm going to play it for you and I want you to listen very carefully for a couple of things. Uh, I'll put the lyrics up there because I know that you all listen to a lot of Western music, but accents sometimes get in the way. Now, we will listen to the song. Uh, the lyrics would tell you one set of meanings, right? But the sound literally enacts for you what happens during the lyrics. Uh, do you want to listen to it? I mean, shall I? Do we have time? Not it? Can we? Are you all okay with listening? Yeah, okay. So I will play the song for you. Um, just quickly read it once before we go into the song, because once you've read the lyrics, I'd like you to give in to the music and listen to it. You know, so you can, the music literally will draw you into it, you know. So this is how it goes. If Can you all see it? Everyone at the back can you know, get it. All right. So this is how the lyrics go. And then what we'll do is I'll... Veronica, can you pick up on the speakers? Will it be on the speakers? There's like a uh, icon on the PPT itself, which you can click it on. I want you to listen for instruments. I want you to listen for tempos. Tempo is the speed 
I want you to listen for directions. And most importantly, I want you to imagine what kind of scenario, scenario opens up for you. And who is the person that we're talking about, right? What is the character in this song? If you notice, everything I'm asking you are literary questions. They're nothing to do with sound composition or music composition. These are very literary composition uh, questions. If uh, one of your professors was to give you a passage to read, these are the standard questions. Who is speaking? What are they saying? Where is the set? What is the location? And what is happening here? Right? How do we transfer those set of questions onto a sound text? Is it... Pardon? I can play it from this system if this can be hooked up. Uh, can this be connected? Okay. You just have to click that button. To Mr. Newton, the game commences with the usual theme as expenses, confidential information, and the diary. This is my investigation. Mm -hmm. I could check it out for me once. Take it out the door. Get to me all sorts. That's like the work. Treasury and treats it. It's always an excuse for it. And when I find the ring, it's a good Still be still. What have you got? The end of the day. What are you got? They go away. Listen, you set our lives. Lions on the land, and the pain of the No compensation.
Um, did you get what I was saying? That the lyric gives us the entire story of a man who's a private investigator, right? This is what his life is like. If you look at the lyrics, you know, this is what your life is like. You know, private investigators, a detective, not even as grand as detectives. They are doing these small time, you know, uh, people who are, you know, checking on either employers or things like that. It's a very sordid life. And that's how the lyric or the poem part of it goes, because I call the lyrics the poems. And uh, if you notice the rest of it, you could hear almost like a duel between guitars. Could you get that? There was a, you know, kind of an argument you would have heard. And somebody who mentioned the heartbeat, you'd notice that the entire suspense, I'm not sure if the audio was clear enough for all of you to hear, but you could, did you all hear the the sound of the heartbeat, which at some point becomes, did you, uh, what what can it become from a heartbeat? When you're, you know, it's it, the entire scene is one of, I'm not sure how clear the audio was, but you actually have the dark, seamy side of a city, men drinking in these dens where people, you know, who work in these kind of uh, stressful jobs, uh, dangerous jobs hang out. And then you hear the car door, you hear the car slam, you hear the uh, perhaps, get, you know, the sound of a gunshot or and then you hear that little cat like thing, something very spooky, the whole thing. And the guitars speaking to each other. It's almost like a voice, you know, like a duel mm -hmm. and a dialogue. And what is very interesting is the bass guitar actually acts as the heartbeat, you know. And we know that in suspense, um, in any kind of, when you're telling a story, what you're trying to do, you're trying to get somebody's heartbeat racing, you know, pulse racing is a sign of somebody being really involved in what you're listening to. Musicians do this a lot. You know, the bass guitar is something which is so integral to musicians because that's where you actually, it's a very bodily art, you know, especially rock. And the whole idea is to get that feeling of fear and anxiety, right? Um, which is why uh, today, of course, there are statutory warnings on concerts saying that flashing lights are being used or, you know, there's excessive use of uh, rhythm and percussions and things like that. Interesting. So this was part of my study that sound creates these spaces, right? When we can't, because when you read this verse where it says a bottle of whiskey and, uh, you know, blinds on the window and a pain behind my eyes, uh, it's well written. It's a nicely constructed line, good poem, all of that. Rhyme and versification is excellent. But more than that, the sound quality creates that space just as much as cinema uses light to sculpt, right? Sound does this and creates for us that sense of hyper, hype, you know, heightened uh, suspense and everything else. So this was something which was very fascinating for me because I grew up in an era uh, 
which is uh, I see a lot of you. I don't know about uh, on Jyotirvas campus, but uh, everyone I see around me is walking around with huge headphones. And I was telling my class this morning, I said, I'm okay with you cutting yourselves off from the rest of the world, but I hope you're engaging with what you're listening to. And it's not just something to you know distract you from the world, but take you into another world. Because for me, that is the world of meaning. You know, That's where we're actually reflecting, contemplating, and in many ways, music is something and sound is something which cannot be blocked. You know, uh, apart from the fact that you can shut doors and soundproof a space, when you're in a room and uh, even if your hearing is not as good as one would expect, you can still pick up the vibrations, right? The percussion and rhythms and things. So it's very fascinating how uh, sound is pervasive. It goes everywhere, it cannot be controlled as easily. In fact, when you read Emily Dickinson, the great American poet, uh, she describes death as the absence of sound. You know, it's when we can't hear anymore, then it's uh, it, it seems to be that seems to be the end of life, you know, in one of her poems. And uh, if I have time, uh, do I have time to play you another piece? Would you like to listen to another piece before you throw me out? <laughs> Your students have decided they're not talking to me. But OK, uh, if it's OK with you, I'd like to play you. Uh, I think you have it. Should I open it here? No, this, see, there is this study done by psychologists that we have a problem. We are so visually driven, this whole world, that if I tell you something, and now all of you have watched music videos, yes? Music videos, MTV brought music videos into the forefront. Before that, in India, music has always been associated with film. So, you know, the minute, um, in fact, when I hear my family, because I'm not a huge uh, fan, but whenever I hear people listening to film music, nobody's talking about the lyrics because when you listen to Western rock and roll, popular music, you're always talking about the lyric, you're talking about the politics, what happened at that time. But when you listen to music from films, immediately I've had people saying, oh, this is uh, Vahid Arayman or this was uh, Shashi Kapoor or, you know, Devanand and all of that. Because the film has imprinted so strongly that we barely listen to the music. It becomes a background score, literally, right? So for me, this was quite interesting because I read a study which said that visuals actually block our ability to fully hear. The more we can see, the less we can hear. And that's quite fascinating. There's a study called, for those of you who are interested in research or looking for something to read uh, interesting, check this study called the McWork effect. I thought I could get it today, but a uh, little difficult. Uh, it is a study, it's available on YouTube, where a man is saying, you know, the sound that you can hear is... Uh, it's actually fur. That's the sound being produced. Fur, fur, fur. He keeps saying that. But because on the video track, you see him saying fur, that is a bilabial sound, uh, we imagine that he's saying fur. But the audio is actually fur. But you are hearing fur. So it's quite interesting for those of you who are studying media, studying uh, you know, how media impacts the world. Please remember that visuals, beautiful as they are, and I'm also into visual culture and I'm working on a lot of those kind of projects as well. Remember that in this world, vision and visuality has precedence and a primacy over what we hear. So it's very dangerous. You know, you can get people to believe what you want by what they see, but the the sounds that they hear are more truthful is what is my, of course, uh, researcher biased uh, statement. I'd like to pay, play you this piece, which is sound and visual. The last piece did not have visuals. This piece has a visual. It's a four minute track, if you don't mind. Are you all okay with listening to that? Hope I'm not holding you back from better things you have to do. So if you listen to this song called, I've written a paper on this, look it up, you'll find it online. I hope you could turn off the light. Thank <laughs> you. 
Racing on the ground, come up behind you, get it. So to say, in a relative way, but you roll. Shoulder of bread, one day, hopes of today. English way, the time is gone. So it's a oh, 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 yeah. I like to be here when I can. And when I come home, old and tired, it's good to warm my boat beside the fire. All the way across the field, join down the iron bell. All the faithful to their knees, to hear the sound of this cold 
chips. It is really easy to make one crore. Thank you for listening, for those of you who were. Uh, <clears throat> I think that second piece made my point that lyrics and sound work together to create uh, our foray into dimensions such as time, which are very difficult for us to understand. In fact, at the last conference where I talked about this particular song, I've also written for it, uh, written about it for a journal. Uh, one of the things I looked at is the song is called Time, and it's from uh, Earl's Court performance by this band Pink Floyd, which is known for its use of these lights and lasers and very psychedelic feel to it and very interesting because they also protested a lot of political injustice. But what is really fascinating is it's not just the lyrics, it's the sound. But on its own, if you had heard the expansive soundtrack, you may not have got this focus right on what they're talking about. And what the lyrics are extremely philosophical because we're talking about time. We're talking about the attributes of time. In fact, at one conference when I presented it, I had people actually, it was an online thing those days uh, during COVID, people actually texted me and said, uh, is your audio working because the song hasn't begun? And I realized that patience is also an attribute of time. The, the longer you can wait, you're a patient person. It's a human quality which is attributed to time. And that is what they do by testing your patience, literally, because you're waiting for the song to begin. Because we've been taught to believe in our various traditions, song begins this way, right? This is how it begins, a beginning, middle, end, and that's how it works. But these people inverted the narrative. They broke the narrative. They, In fact, the videos also showed you the inside of a clock, because, of course, we know through philosophy that there are two ways of looking at time. Personal, which is Kairos, and Kronos, which is the larger dimension of time. All of this is captured through these lyrics and the performance. Of course, there's lots to say about it. And those of you who are musicians, you understand time signatures. You understand timing. You understand tempos. You understand temporality. All of this are also part of text. All of this goes into creating meaning, which is, at the end of the day, a text. For Because... Uh, Without that sense of constructed meaning, a text is not a text. It's just a, an example or a specimen. For instance, I say this a lot. It's a very silly example. But if you were walking down the street outside college and you saw a little chicken bone lying on the... Sorry to all the vegans. But if there was a chicken bone lying on the road, you would just step over it or walk past it. But if you were in Mohenjo-daro and you saw a bone lying on the street, uh, you would call for archaeologists. It would be a huge discovery. So context and how we construct meaning actually imbues a space with textuality. Uh, for a longer lecture, perhaps some other time, I talked to you about an architect whom I used to study music, uh, Andy Lefebvre. Uh, he's almost a guru for me, a French uh, social Marxist philosopher, socialist uh, philosopher, who talked about how spaces cannot be read, but they are created. For instance, uh, to enter a place like Forum or Nexus, you have to be a certain kind of person. Not everyone can. There's no rule which says the poor cannot go into Nexus. But have we seen people of a certain kind or a lower you know, dispos uh, a place in society actually accessing these spaces. Because spaces are created through cultural practices. So by just frowning on people, we have kept them out of certain spaces. And that is a cultural practice. You know, when you cannot offer a welcome to someone. So very often when we have these programs in our college and students ask me, do we need to do a welcome speech and farewell? I tell them, see, these are the ways in which we read a space. I can read a space by the number of formalities or informalities or whatever it is that we do. But every cultural practice within a space creates a space. And I added to that the concept of sound. Sound as the indicator for what a space is. So that was basically what my research was about. And that's why I called it an oral narrative. What I hear, there's about 150 of you in this auditorium. And 150 of you heard 150 different stories. Because your orality is you. It's not me. So my oral skills, I'm talking, but not all of you will listen the way I want you to or somebody else does. Somebody must be listening to more things, to the timber, the timbre of my voice and all of that. Some of you might just be uh, tuned out and that's perfectly legitimate. So 
the point that I'm trying to make, and I hope I've made today, is that a text becomes a text because of certain qualities. And two qualities that can be read onto a text are sound and space. Right? I hope it gave you some sense of clarity about what, I hope I did some justice to what I was supposed to say. Thank you very much. And I'm open to questions now, if you have any and have the time and inclination for questions. Sorry, I ripped through that a bit, but. I mean, there's no questions you don't have to force yourself to ask, but maybe uh, I'll. Don't ask me difficult questions, please. And in any case, a uh, lot of your faculty have my phone number, so you could text me if you are nervous about asking. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you were saying about some philosopher uh, about whom on architecture you were yes. influenced. Could yes. you say about him a little more? Like yeah. his name and something, yeah. his philosophy he, which inspired you? Yeah, Le Fabre, you, you spell his name as L-E-F-E-B-V-R-E. -E -E. Le Fabre, uh, he's uh, Henri Le Fabre, French uh, theorist. He's actually very uh, interesting because he talks about city spaces. That's another area that I have done some work with, urban studies and city spaces. And he says this exactly is his argument that when you look at a space, now, for instance, my own experience with Jyoti Nivas is coming back for me after many, many years. So I came to the place that I used to work at 20 years ago which was very different from what it is today, right? And I had this concept in my head because of my lived experience. But revisiting the space, the concept breaks, and I have this actual experience of the place, right? My lived experience, which will now shape my new experience, new concept, right? Now, I'll go away saying this place is state of the art. It's not as small and as uh, cozy as it used to be. It's much bigger. It's much, you know, more... Uh, you know, state of the art than it used to be 20 years ago. So this is how we perceive my perception of this space before I entered was the memory that I had of it. The con concept is my lived experience of it. And I take away a concept, right? Probably if I came back here in a couple of days or when the streets are better or something like that, my perception will change. So spaces are dynamic. They keep changing because cultural spaces change, cultural practice changes, right? So, so many of you come from different parts of the city. Each of you has a different experience of this space. And so space is not static. It, it is what each one of us brings to this space also, right? So he his name is Henri, H-E-N-R-I, Henry, not to be pretentious. He's just Henry Lefebvre, L-E-F-E-B-V-R-E. Very fascinating critic. Uh, his seminal work is called uh, The Production of Space which is uh, where he says spaces have been produced now, or we'd like to believe that, you know, malls and things are spaces which we construct, but not really. I can change. For instance, uh, it, during the lockdown, my bedroom became my office, right? So that's my lived experience. And that's how it now becomes an office space. I made my decision sitting there, right? And the, which is uh, very different, which affected people in other spaces. So that is how our practices, socio-spatial practices, actually define what a space becomes. And it that is fluid, is the point. Um, Ma'am, I actually wanted to ask you about the special uh, theory that you were explaining to us, right? So we can, can we also say that space is space actually exists, but it is like the humans and all the other creatures that is living within that particular space that attaches particular meaning to in that particular space. I mean, it it is already existing, but it is us who are giving meanings to this particular spaces. Like, so it, it has been existing since the very beginning of time. Yeah. But ever since that we came, we came into this particular world, or the creatures that are living in this particular world, they're attaching these meanings to this particular spaces. Mm. Otherwise, these spaces didn't have any sort of meaning. So it can be different for different people. So it can be perceptual, right? We can say it that way. You're absolutely right about the fact that where we live and how we live, that is what I would have called, I termed as uh, social spatial practices. But 
uh, I, I found that part of your question interesting. What happens pre-instinct, pre, -instinct, pre uh, us living on this earth? Or what if there's some space which we don't know about, which is there and nothing has happened yet? Uh, let's look at those places as what Lefebvre, the critic I was talking about, theorist, calls absolute spaces, right? Absolute is a space uh, which exists by itself, which does not need any kind of intervention, right? It's very fascinating that there are two absolute spaces in the world, believe it or not, but both we have tampered with and really facing the consequences now. One was nature. Nature was an absolute space. It did not need human intervention. It had its own uh, cycles and rhythms. And the other space, believe it or not, is art, the world of fine art, which has an autotelic existence. Autotelic, uh, my students laugh at me because I say this word a thousand times a day. Autotelic in the sense that it exists on its own rhythms, right? You don't need. Uh, now, you might ask me, but what about the fact that artists are sitting and creating this space? The artist is only, if you've read T.S. Eliot, and I'm sure you have, uh, tradition and the individual talent, that the artist is only the conduit, the pipe or the, you know, uh, the instrument, the work of art exists by itself. It needs neither us nor the world to actually defend it, right? So uh, I know uh, it's quite interesting because these absolute spaces exist around us. They don't need human practice or uh, organic practices to actually define them. The natural world, of course, subsumed today by our own, uh, you know, greed and uh, forays into, you know, we've, we've ruined that. We've broken it down. So what happens, Lefebvre says, absolute spaces become abstracted when we live in. So now, when I look at this place, this is not a place created by me or you. This is a place created by uh, civil engineers and architects who designated this space as a place for performances, right? But if I'm really tired today, I could just lie down there and take a nap. There's nothing stopping me from doing that except social practice. It's not the right thing to do, right? But if I was desperate, I would do that and no one can stop me. So we can change a space by just changing its practice. You know, if you look at the greatest protesters, that's what they were doing, taking spaces and taking over spaces, right? Conquering spaces. So I'm not sure. I agree with you on this, that... Uh, we make a space what it is. Everything is created by us. And that's a reading, but it can be changed as well. Thank oh, you, Matt. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting thoughts. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of questions raised online. So mm. I'll just read out them to you. Mm. What avenues of research does your topic open up? Oh, there's no end to the <laughs> number of things. One is, you know, you'll find that hopefully after I've been uh, talking about space, you will also change the way you look at, um, no, I, I'm not expecting you to change and all that, but I hope you remember some of the things I said and look at how uh, spaces can be changed through practices. So if you find certain spaces, you know, like let's say um, certain kinds, like I said, a, a mall is a place for upper uh, you know, elite people to go to people from a certain class, certain disposition. What if tomorrow I was to take, uh, again, I'll have to be there. You can't just let uh, people from a, a lower, you know, class background or, you know, less moneyed people to walk into a mall. So what if we started changing spaces? Now, how do spaces change, you know, over the years? Traffic, just do a study of Bangalore's traffic. What is happening? In fact, architectural theories are uh, largely influenced by socio-cultural practices. I have a friend who did his entire thesis on this concept that there's no such thing as a flood. The word flood is meaningless. There are no floods. A river will flow in a certain way. Rain will fall in a certain way. If it is flooding, it is because we have created some barricades, barriers or obstructions. The world was meant to have rain, was meant to have torrential rain. It was meant to have, flow, you know, rivers flowing at whatever high speeds and ebb and flow and all of this. But we have created this, right? So what if we changed our architectural approaches to life? And this is where as students of literature, we become very uh, crucial to these narratives because we are observers. We observe, if you've read Kubla Khan's poem, I'm sorry, Coleridge's poem, Kubla Khan, uh, you'll, you'll remember what he says, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man. Who is to know what there is and what we can map if we observe? And I do believe that poetry and art, because of this, you know, we are not under too much scrutiny for logic. We get away with a lot of inventions also. We have the freedom to also produce more knowledge and more 
uh, spaces. So there is a lot of research that you can do. City spaces, you can research, you can research sound, you can research a million things uh, with orality. Even, I was just telling uh, some of your faculty, I can even uh, look at acoustics in a hall like this and decide whether this is a performance space or a conference hall. You know, these things can be decided through our understanding of spatiality and sound. Um, Thank you, ma'am. That actually answers the second question also. Uh, <laughs> however, the second question was, yeah. how can this topic be linked or incorporated in the UG literature program? Uh -huh. So you've answered Bring that. Bring rock and roll to your classrooms. <laughs> And uh, yeah, yeah, we are doing it. We have uh, these courses in our rooms, uh, in our classrooms, because um, I just finished a session with a uh, rock and roll class. Because we, why we look at rock and roll particularly is rock and roll is a phenomenon of the uh, which peaked from the 1960s. Today, uh, we, I'm also guiding a PhD thesis on uh, Kendrick Lamar and uh, rap and the whole concept of uh, hip hop as a streaming and how the aesthetics of streaming has now created mu new music, right? Um, very interesting areas to research because, uh, like I said, okay, any story that you tell, when you sit down with your grandparents or you tell your nieces and nephews a story, you always begin with uh, any people from Tamil Nadu here. How do you begin your stories? Somebody, I could hear somebody say, Vururla. Yeah, our stories begin with Vururla. Anybody who has any other way of, Vururla means in a little town somewhere, in a space. Anybody here who begins once upon a time, that's very European, if you notice. You know, Grimm's brothers and all that. Once upon a time. I am told, and unfortunately I don't know for sure, but I was told by my students from Nagaland, that a lot of their stories began with, not in my words, but in the words of my ancestors. And I was quite fascinated. See, these gave me links into how people form their identities, right? For me, a space is important. Something like that, you know, in a forest or something. But if you are from a different place where your engagement with your land is different, I was told that in uh, certain parts of the Northeast, uh, the I mean, everywhere actually, ge our, ge our geography informs our imagination. So you see, when you are listening to music, you're also listening to the, uh, if you heard bands like Indian Ocean, have you all heard Indian Ocean? Now, Indian Ocean Kandisa, use, they use an ancient Aramaic Syriac song and they use, lead, I mean, they use Western instrumentation to conserve a piece of music from somewhere else. All of these are literary aspects. Now, why I brought in this whole thing about how do we begin our stories is a story is always told in a time and a space. Once upon a time, you know, far, far away, long, long ago in a galaxy, whatever, Star Wars, you, know, you see that opening crawl. Every story begins with a time and space intersection. That is how you create a place or a location, right? So songs are just that. They are literary pieces because they intersect time and space, right? And they add this, uh, in, sp in the space of words, they add sound. And sound is uh, prolific, it, I mean, it's everywhere. So you can add meaning. Again, there are also endemic sounds, which you will only hear in a certain space. Like for instance, um, let's say, uh, not, uh, not just languages, you will hear traffic if it is Bangalore, there's nothing else you're going to hear. If it is somewhere else, you'll hear bird call, you'll hear waterfalls. Uh, Christ has a campus in Pune, Lavasa. I was so shocked when I went there. I was there for a couple of weeks. You can't hear a single car. It's unbelievable. You can only hear birds and waterfalls. You know? You're most welcome to visit. It's uh, two hours from Pune. So, you know, you can tell a space by its sound qualities also. So that's how stories emerge. You know, those stories will be sound-rich stories, not visuals. So... Uh, like I said, time, space, intersections, and the orality will create our narratives for us. Audiotopias are great. Yes. Can't hear you. Uh, I kind of fangirled when you uh, mentioned Ka uh, Kandisha because uh, I'm East Syriac, uh, Sirumalabar Catholic. Mm. So uh, that was a re really interesting point. I'm glad that, you know, you're talking about this, uh, like uh, bands like Indian Ocean in forums like this. Yes. Um, my point, um, what my question was, um, I think we can all agree on the fact that we all... Um, attribute value to things differently we have our own perspectives mm. and even to a space also um yeah whose meaning um this might be political but whose meaning uh is more important 
uh, how do we like yes you you're absolutely uh, that's a lovely question you know i mean i'm not saying this like a lot of speakers say this to validate uh, uh, young minds but let me tell you that in when i teach uh, poetry also i have a method by which uh, a formalist approach you know it's from the russian formalist uh, thing how to read a text and one of the things i tell people is leave meaning out of it you know as a literature scholar so you know when you ask me this question i will have to ask you in what capacity are you asking me because if you were to ask me because i know this spaces are contested right um, mm-hmm. in fact bangalore has what we call it's a very unpleasant thing we have what is called hostile architecture so you know believe it or not if you go to certain places like uh, the mg road boutiques and things you know where the designer shops are they have spikes in the floor now you and i in our nice shoes because we wear you know nice well soled shoes we can walk over those spikes it doesn't matter to us at all right but those spaces could would have been at one point home to the, the homeless they slept under those awnings of your big design brands right but today they can't uh, spaces like parks uh, benches have you noticed in some of the parks the benches have a you know they kind of what's the word concave the convex you know they <laughs> bend outwards sorry so you can't sleep on those benches you what about the metro benches also you know they're not meant for you to sit for a long time that's functional we're supposed to keep moving but in spaces we have created hostile spaces right so this question about who's mean and it's so fascinating because yeah you will every time you do research in fact when i guide my phd scholars also the first thing i do is sit down and write a page for me telling me who you are what is your position your subject position are you writing as a scholar because this topic is cool or are you writing because you are an angry young person because your land has been taken away or your people are suffering put that down and from there we will draw our trajectory so a space can be read in multiplicity so why do we restrict it to one reading you know that's what lafabre is saying if you read it if you read it by the labels which is why i'm totally against labeling i refuse to label myself as any particular ideology or anything because i want to be fluid right it's not and and that that is a problem that we face today people are talking about fluidity in the most rigid terms you know identify as this identify as that what if i don't want to so but unfortunately convenience public and social convenience makes us label spaces and say mall it's just an expensive overpriced market at the end of the day right but it also gives us a certain in ambience ambience is another dangerous word so your question which me is always going to be contentious because whichever you you are you're always going to be at odds with somebody else so when you sit down to write identify it's just fair that you tell us which you is speaking so i can also uh, build my defense or converse with you at with that you you know what i mean i hope i'm not losing everybody no it makes sense confusing Uh, yeah. my this thing was a, a little vague i did not put a lot of thought into it mm. uh, but uh, i realized uh, one in like one interesting thing that uh, uh, we could relate to is that the spaces uh, uh, like our colleges uh, yes, of course there, yeah. uh, like there's a certain uh, like uh, weightage to names mm. uh, in the academic spaces like oh you're from jnu oh you're from christ so uh, like yeah so it, it so the onus is on you to detach yourself from those labels and to make sure that the space around you is something that you know the, like for instance i mean uh, i'm not a very religious person but there are lovely parables in the bible right stories about uh, why is it that someone could not help somebody you know you see somebody like the story of the good samaritan right because that space is restricted you can't do that but the person who actually helped just disregarded all the labels all the spaces around him and went ahead and did it so that's appealing to your humanity are you willing to detach from a label very difficult uh, question <laughs> i'm not asking you to answer that but uh, like uh, so yeah. i'm really sorry but how can one detach themselves from the space or use sound to detach oneself like from the uh, like egotistical uh, identity and this formation of identity i um the there's the i'll give you the short answer because i think a lot of people would uh, might beat you up afterwards for keeping them back but uh, i I'll, uh, it's fascinating because how does one use sound right uh, if we did a survey unfortunately research makes us do all these things like take a survey do a vox pop or get a schedule put together and get everybody's opinions uh, no two people in this room will have the same listening taste right so 
playlist. In fact, this is part of the research my scholar is doing. A playlist on Spotify. I have a playlist which is, uh, you know, Gypsy Jazz, which has all the cafe jazz from Paris. And there are, this is nothing new. There's some 2000 playlists with Gypsy Jazz on it. Each of us have curated it separately. And then identity emerges. You know, in fact, if you look at Spotify, the next time you do that, look at how our playlist, and there's also a problem. The algorithm makes you makes it suggest songs for you. Uh, uh, sometimes that annoys me. I don't really want to listen to Brian Adams. You know, just because I listen to 70s or 80s rock, I'm not really a Brian Adams fan. So why? So you see, you need to be alive all the time and questioning things around. Have I taken everyone's time to... Uh, I hope I'm not. Uh, I mean, we can have a longer conversation, please. My numbers are numbers with uh, your faculty. Please take it. Happy to answer any other questions. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Uh, where, where where are you? I can't tell. I'm yes. here. I'm here. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, someone that said I can't tell. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, you said you were going to elaborate on those who cannot hear or are hard of hearing. Yeah. Could you uh, talk more yeah. about how um, sound uh, works with that? Sound is basically vibrations, right? So it's quite fascinating that uh, it's not, we don't hear only through our ears. So uh, there's a lot of physics behind this. If you reach a certain, you know, like, let's say, what is this called? The aircraft, which, the, so the supersonic, right? Beyond certain uh, speeds of sound waves, uh, we, our human ears can only pick up sounds on these frequencies. But that does not mean that frequencies above and below it don't exist. They do exist, right? Which is why there's so many myths about animals. We say dogs can see ghosts and things like that. And recently, something I read on uh, one of these uh, Instagram pages. Um, yeah, I do a lot of this scrolling. And I came across something about how octopus, they can see more than we can, colors. We can only see this spectrum, you know, the Vibgyo spectrum, but they can actually see colors beyond us. How I long to be an octopus that day. I was thinking, wow, I'd like to be, you know, literally the Beatles song uh, in an octopus's garden. But uh, maybe the Beatles were on to something. But uh, apart from all that they were on. But it's really fascinating that uh, Helen Keller trained herself to read vibrations. So the problem is not with the, what I was saying, the first part of what I'm saying is more important, reading. Today, reading is not restricted to words. But then reading never was restricted to words. Uh, I say this in all humility and a lot of affection for all academia. I think academia did this, you know, made reading restricted to a certain form. And uh, this, but research has proved that one can read with, one, with one's entire body. You know, being immersed, we call, call it immersive practices. We learn languages not always through reading, writing, right? through listening, through imitating, and through the kind of guttural sounds. My own mother tongue is a very guttural sound. It comes into my English as well. So the ability to hear is not always only oral. It is also physical. So I don't know whether that's why I asked uh, uh, ma'am to raise the volume on that Pink Floyd track, which I played for you. Not that I was trying to create uh, you know, an anarchic situation in your auditorium, but really because I wanted you to feel the effect and you have a really good uh, sound system today, uh, what we were listening to. Uh, you can feel those guitars in your chest. Could, could you all feel them? And if those of you who've been to concerts and things, you know, you can, why do you want to be in the front? Because you can actually feel those vibrations. That's the difference between live performances and listening to, you know, radio and, and I mean, not even radio, internet digitally produced sound because you are there for that entire bodily experience. So it is not always only through our auditory system is what, of course, it's very difficult. I'm not uh, negating the fact that it's a tough life because you need another set of reading parameters or um, strategies to be able to read sound. And I'm not talking about music at all here. Musicians, uh, I have a lot of friends in our music department at Christ. We have a degree in Western music. Uh, they have a lot of uh, ideas on Western music and how it's produced and how it's consumed and all of that. But for me, it's not about the Western music, it's only the composition. We are also talking about sound around, right? Because every live performance changes. So a text is never the same again, right? And how do I know it? It is through the ambience, the rhythms that are created, the vibrations that you hear, and stress levels. Because uh, to somebody who asked me in the beginning, 
pulse is very close to also what we hear as footbeat, the footprints. You hear somebody running, it's like your pulse. So these things can also be intertwined. So there's so many ways, you know, and those are all vibrations. So that's, I hope, gives you some kind of an answer to what you were asking. It's not so simple at all. And also I said visuals imprint. So what you see will also color your sound. You know. Anyway. Um, last question. Yeah, sure, sure. Where, what? Here. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Can you see me? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, I remember you came to Christ Yashwanpur campus <laughs> and you briefed the English department. Ruchira ma'am was there, Krishna sir was there. Yes. And you told the psychology English literature class about how sad we were as a major because it was psychology and English literature. And at that moment, the meaning you gave to that space, it meant a lot for a lot of us. So I remember you talked about something and when you left, a lot of us were very, we got very emotional because the meaning you gave to that space at that moment mm. meant a lot. So uh, you are accusing me or? No, I'm not accusing you. So the thing is, you asked her if she was willing to detach from mm. her labels. Mm. But the very institution you represent, because you left after that, yeah. and then Christ Ashwampur campus, we were having construction going on during that mm. time. The classes got so tiring that I think by the end of second sem, half of the class dropped out. Half of us? Dropped out. A lot of people dropped out. Dropped out. Yeah, yeah. True, true. I know the construction uh, construction sound can drive anybody insane. insane. <laughs> and the attendance as well. So when you look at it... Hey, that's not fair. <laughs> but when you look at Christ as an institution, yeah. and when, when I've heard so many stories, when I've been in the institution myself, but I've met the faculty as well. Yeah. Are you proud of the space you've been giving meaning to? The, uh, <laughs> this is what is this? It's turning into a press conference. Uh, um, no, no, that's okay. I mean, I'm happy to answer that because, uh, okay, uh, you, you, since you know me and we have a little history of knowing each other, let me tell you this. I don't believe in pride. So I don't believe that any space has constructed me. I construct the spaces around me, right? So the experience that I have of Christ, and I've been there for so long, and and uh, your, some of your faculty will know that I've been known to be quite rebellious in my ways of thinking, you can see from my studies and things. And uh, I do believe, and, I, and this is not me, you know, I'm not making a case for myself. We go right back to Christopher Malu, who said, you know, heaven and hell, these are places that we make, or, you know, what we make of our, the mind makes uh, heaven or hell. So I do believe that uh, it's sad that a lot of people tend to, this is why I think I was answering you, it's dangerous to get too dependent on labels, right? Uh, Christ is not my only identity. I mean, it's a great part of my identity because of how you reading me, you're reading me now as the person you met at that time who said all these things and all of that. But when I, if you were to get to know me more, you would know that none of these places, I studied in a very prestigious school in Bangalore. I don't even mention it anywhere where I talk or anything because I don't want to be, it's not that I'm not proud of the school. I love the school. I love everything about it. The colleges I studied in Chennai were some of the premier institutions, uh, but I don't want them to shape who I am because I think there is a sense of self in me which says I am who I am. My research happened at the Madras Christian College. My research happened in Christ University, talking about spaces and things which perhaps more uh, liberal spaces may not even have tolerated. So I do think that we define our space around us, you know. And uh, yes, very often you could be called deluded because you are thinking this is my space. But who is to define what reality is at the end of the day? I, kind, I find the kind of opportunities. For me, research is a lot. So these kind of research opportunities came to me there, right? Yes, I know we have attendance and we have dress codes and all of that. Uh, for most of us, it has ceased to matter. I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of people, your friends, who have lots to say about it. And that's legitimate, right? There are plenty of things people are saying about some of the premier institutions, including Harvard, which I don't want to go into. But that's hardly what is important, right? At the end of the day, you have a mind and a soul. Focus on that. That's my answer. I hope I didn't get too personal. <laughs> but, yeah, thank you. Anything? <laughs>
that's okay please don't uh, stop them. i mean you're most welcome to carry on the debate okay thank you i'll be here for another 5 10 minutes so thank you very much uh, department of english for having me here and all of you for very very interesting questions we happy to take this forward thank you Good afternoon everyone. I'm honored to deliver the word of thanks on this delightful occasion. I would like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed principal, Dr. Sister Louisa Sebastian. Her unwavering support and inspiration have been instrumental in shaping our college. A special thanks to our guest speaker, Dr. Shobhana P. Matthews, for sharing her invaluable knowledge and insight with us. Her lecture on the complex relationship between sound, text, and spatiality has left us enlightened and inspired. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. We are also grateful to the head of the department, Ms. Maya Harvey, the coordinators, Ms. Suparna Singh Gupta, and Dr. Shweta Singh, and all the teachers of English department from the for their constant guidance and encouragement. A big shout out goes to the office bearers and the members of Lit Club whose hard work made this event a success. I extend my gratitude to the technical team, Mr. Praveen, Mr. Francis, and our cameraman, Mr. Richard. Last but not least, a heartfelt thank you to our wonderful audience. Your presence and active involvement have made this event even more meaningful. As we conclude this event, I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you for being a part of this memorable day.